Hello and welcome to Tell Me How You Did It. I'm Namrita Zakaria and I'm here to bring to you my handpicked list of some of India's finest brands. Yes, our best homegrown companies that can compete with the world's best and still win the battle hands down. These companies range from food, fashion and film to home, art and design. I'm only too happy to talk to the founders who not only chased their rainbows, they also made India proud. Make sure you tune in at hdsmartcast.com week after week to shake the hands that built our best businesses. Listen to them tell me how they did it. The world of interior design, furniture and architecture is going through a massive transformation in the last few years. Indian companies celebrating authenticity, craft, and a very local-centric design language are really coming into their own. Leading this pack is Phantom Hands, a Bangalore-based gorgeous but young company. Architects speak of it in hushed tones, almost as if in reverence. It was started in 2015 by founder Deepak Srinath. Phantom Hands now enjoys cult status. Deepak is here with me today to tell us how he and his company are Indian Design's best kept secrets, phantoms, as it were. Welcome to Tell Me How You Did It, Deepak. I'm really glad to have you here. Thank you, Namrata. It's my pleasure to be on your show. And thank you for the wonderful introduction. You started out Phantom Hands as a curated site, selling vintage um, antiques, uh, collectibles. How did you chance upon making furniture there? Uh, well, like you said, Phantom Hands started life as a curated catalog of vintage objects. Uh, this was in 2013 when I was still in my investment banking gig. Um, so this was more of a hobby project. Vintage objects, especially vintage furniture, uh, was, was something that has always fascinated me, especially the stories behind these objects. And uh, my original idea was to make Phantom Hands a marketplace for curated uh, uh, vintage objects from India. Uh, down the line, uh, we realized that they were not, while it was great as a hobby project, uh, when I took the plunge and you know got into it full time, I realized that there wasn't enough well-made objects that we could source to make it a full-time business or to make it sustainable. Uh, Around that time, I discovered the story of Chandigarh's furniture, uh, the design history of Chandigarh, and, and the story was fascinating. It drew me in. I made numerous trips to Chandigarh. Uh, the, 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 the design spoke to me, the clean, clean lines, the simplicity, the, uh, the utilitarian purpose, the functional aspect of the furniture, all of it resonated deeply with me. This became your launch collection, right? This Chandigarh. was our launch Edith. collection, you're right. Yeah. So uh, I think at that point, the idea of making furniture was something that was, um, you know, that, that, that I was toying with. Um, but, but and, and also kind of diving deeper into the Chandigarh story, I realized that there's not, while a lot of vintage products, vintage pieces were being, you know, sold internationally and all of that, uh, many of the vintage pieces or, or even the pieces that were being made currently were very poorly made. The quality of craftsmanship uh, was not as good as, you know, the really old pieces that one saw in, uh, one still saw in museums and uh, offices in Chandigarh. And therefore the idea of re-editing these pieces uh, with a quality of craftsmanship and uh, materials and, you know, making that, that could make these pieces fit into our contemporary homes, contemporary lives, make them more robust. Uh, that was the intention behind starting the first collection. But why is Chandigarh so important? I mean, it, the city seems to inspire designers, architects endlessly. And for you, especially at Phantom Hands, you know, you'll use it as a starting point of, you know, this modernist India sort of design language, that whole ethos. So why do you, how do you, can you explain that? Look, I think just Chandigarh's architecture is incredibly well known. Uh, not much was known about the furniture that was created for the city until about 10 years ago. The genre chairs, for example. Which the are chairs that are popularly known as genre chairs. Uh, 
Um, but yes, you know, not much was known about the furniture. Ironically, the West discovered the Chandigarh furniture story much, much before uh, a wider audience in India did. Um, you know, as you as it's well documented now, a number of French uh, vintage furniture dealers uh, came to Chandigarh, discovered this this furniture. Uh, you know, they they took it out of India, they sold it in auctions, and created a lot of awareness and um, you know almost hype around these pieces. So once that happened, and then you know the news of of, of these pieces fetching huge prices and auctions began to um, get around in India. That's when people in India suddenly uh, started taking, you know, started uh, noticing these pieces or even, um, you know, trying to understand the history of these pieces. So uh, anyway, to go back to your question, I think Chandigarh is fascinating because, especially the furniture of Chandigarh is fascinating because it was, in my mind, the world's first open source design project. Um, there were there were about a hundred designs created, maybe more. I think a lot of pieces are not documented even, um, and they were given out. The blueprints were given out to several carpentry workshops to make, to modify as as required by a specific site. The design language was then adopted by several Indian architects and designers. Um, who, who produced these pieces or variants of these pieces over a, over a 30, 40 year period. And uh, the design then, you know, it, it wasn't restricted to Chandigarh. You know, the, the design language sort of permeated across the country and one can find uh, uh, similar pieces made in, the simil in a similar style in government offices in Bangalore or Chennai or, you know, Lucknow. And I've seen these pieces. So, so it really kind of became... A, a kind of pioneering modern Indian design story. So I think that's why Chandigarh is so fascinating. Can you share your um, some examples of your re-editions of this um, this Chandigarh ethos? Uh, sure. So we started with what is with three chairs and more. It it, it was more of a of an experiment. It wasn't you know something that we seriously. Uh, sort we didn't even know if 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 you know there would be de a demand for it or anybody would buy it or any of that. We just we just kind of looked at several vintage pieces and decided to uh, re-edit three of them. Uh, one of them is popularly known as the office chair with the signature inverted V legs or compass legs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of them is the easy armchair, and the third one was the X leg office chair, office armchair. Okay. So we made three of these and then um, sort of prototype them with with a couple of carpenters and um, you know put them on. at that point we were still doing the uh, antiques website so we, we put them out there and nothing happened for a few months um, and I was at, at that point um, on the verge of you know thinking that this is not going to work and then and then we a couple of people uh, actually bought these pieces but ironically they didn't buy it for the design um, the wood that we had used was reclaimed timber from uh, a well known school in bangalore whose auditorium had had, had been demolished so alumni of that of, school, of that school got wind of our that we had used the wood and purchased it because they wanted some connection to their school they, they didn't know anything about or much about the design history so that's sweet too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was our beginning. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, like a lot of brands or ventures, there is, there are a couple of serendipitous things that happen, which really, mm, you know, propel the brand or business and help. So, so something like that happened with us too. Um, an interior designer from London called Nicholas Chander came across our website saw these chairs and got in touch with us. Uh, Nicholas is somebody who was Paul Smith's interior designer and had I mean, done the interiors of many of Paul Smith's stores across the world. Yeah. Uh, so Nicholas uh, contacted us and came down to Bangalore to see us. And at that point we were 
literally two carpenters and a dog in a garage apart from me <laughs> so so uh, but nevertheless i think nicholas liked the the thought behind the endeavor the the quality of 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 what we were producing the authenticity in terms of the craftsmanship that we were uh using to produce these pieces and he placed an order for 40 odd pieces uh for a, for a very high end co-working space in new york and uh, you know we that was a, an incredible learning experience for us making these pieces exporting them we learned about logistics packing all of that um and and you know it was very well received um the It, the co-working space is called Spring Place in New York, and in fact, I've heard that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, opened it and he sat on one of these chairs and things like that. So you know, that's how we got noticed. And then a number of architects and interior designers, especially from Brooklyn, that community, saw our furniture and they they became our customers. And you know, then word of mouth happened. And yeah. Yeah, mm. the incredibly stylish pieces and and definitely very very original. Ah, uh, but I want to talk about your sourcing of wood because you touched upon this reclaimed wood from the auditorium. Ah, uh, a lot of what you use now is reclaimed wood, and um, the new wood you are committed to verify the source. Yeah. So why is this important to you? Is this just an environmental? Um, consciousness that you'd like to promote or this is just some sort of responsibility that you want to take as a company i think both i think you you cannot be a furniture maker and not be conscious of of um, you know where you source your material from um of course i mean it's it, it is because wood at the end of the day a tree has come down for you to make your furniture you cannot run away from that but um uh, nevertheless i think we do have a responsibility to make sure that the wood that we use is not illegally um sourced from you know by illegally felling trees in a forest in a where it wasn't supposed to have been chopped down or um therefore i think reclaimed timber is also extremely important for us we try and use as much of reclaimed timber as we can because you know you know that you know it's it's kind of the circle of life in a way you know so most of the reclaimed timber that we good we that we actually get is from buildings that are demolished um the the, the quality of teak teak wood is extremely high in most of these old buildings um but uh, very often uh, the the problem that we have is the supply of reclaimed timber is not consistent it's yeah. you know um so we have to supplement it with new timber too and we try and so we 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 actually source it from um a, a timber dealer that we know and trust immensely and they um so we we verify they actually show us the authorized government documents and things like that uh, that that come with it well that's the planet but your name phantom hands which i love takes care of people as well it's almost like an homage to to artisans um, you know to the hands that sort of don't get the credit across any craft especially in india so why was this credit so why was passing this credit on so important to you you know i think this the name originated uh, from our vintage furniture days because we you know beautifully made pieces but nobody knew who had made them so they were you know literally phantom hands who had made these pieces and when we started making furniture uh we found that it was still apt because while we now knew who was making these pieces our our artisans were all generational um uh, craftsmen who had inherited their skill from their fathers and forefathers so in a way there was phantom hands behind the skills that manifested in these products so so the name was still apt so yeah, yeah i mean now we try and um, of course i think you know be it our social media be it our website we we try and make sure that our craftsmen and craftswomen are not phantoms anymore we try and you know the their names are published their stories are published we talk about them but but still the name remains apt 
Well, we see it across India, right? The crafts always remain at the bottom of the supply chain and almost in all cases, they receive the least where, you know, the distribution of money from the price tag is concerned. Yeah, yeah, that is very true. Um, and, and while there are a number of efforts, I mean, not just with furniture, but I see awareness of, uh, you know, of, of sort of responsibility towards crafts and craftspersons spreading a lot, but I think there's a lot to be done still. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's also remarkable importance that you've given to cane, cane weaving, which obviously I presume comes from the whole Chandigarh design language. Um, but can you tell me why it's so popular now, cane weaving? I think that's a good question. I think it's not just, I think globally we are seeing a resurgence of cane furniture. I think it ties, so I, I think it, because there is such a move towards handmade products, uh, products that are especially, you know, artisanal products versus industrially made products. Um, I think cane is such an obvious manifestation of a handmade product. You yeah. know, it is, yeah. it is, um, it's a skill that's very tangible, that's very, you know, um, and, and so I think therefore cane furniture has, has seen a revival in, in, in recent years. And um, yeah, so therefore, Again, it, and, and also given that we started with the Chandigir collection and the contemporary collections that we make also um, have cane as, an, as, as a very important signature element. Um, many of our new pieces have that too. So we continue that, that tradition of, um, you know, cane being. I don't know about other Indian cities, but in Bombay, it's like a very Bombay Parsi club colonial you know, it's 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 part of our design language as well. It's yes. as Bombay as Art Deco is, I think. I mean, very much in South India too. I mean, the, yeah. our, our plantation chair, uh, colonial yeah, yeah, furniture, yeah. also uh, places like Chettinad in Tamil Nadu where yeah. there's there's much, there's, there's such a rich furniture history. So cane has always been an important part of uh, our, our furniture in South India too. So. Love that you know interior designers as well as furniture designers in India they've moved to um, you know Indian textiles for the upholstery it 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 brings authenticity to the design as well as a product and it goes very well with that whole um, Indian crafts language idea as well so I want to ask you about your uh, commitment to using handwoven textiles for your upholstery. That's a that's a good question because it's something that's very close to my heart. Um, we, you know, we started with cane furniture, but but you know, um, a couple of years ago we started an upholstery unit, and uh, we now have a collection of upholstered furniture, both from the Chandigarh design era as well as contemporary uh, pieces. But is it all hand hand loomed, hand woven, or it's a mix of? Not all of it. So when we started off, we used uh, and and we still produce some pieces with industrial well with velvets and uh, wool and 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 you know very high quality but industrially produced fabrics. Uh, but our core philosophy and our value system was always aligned towards handmade textiles and especially Indian textiles that were craft based and. So there are two collaborations that 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 kind of helped us, um, you know, foray into the, sort of put it out there. Um, I think maybe you can edit that, but <laughs> um, so let me just rephrase that. So do you want so me to repeat are, the question? I can. I can. Talk, we can talk yeah, about yeah, to yeah, the staff. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. I love that interior designers as well as furniture designers in India are slowly but sure-footedly moving towards Indian textiles for the upholstery. And I see that with you at Phantom Hands as well. So do you want to tell us a little more about where you source your textiles from and how committed you are to use Indian fabric? Sure, uh, Amrita. That's a question that's very close to my heart because upholstery, we're very... Uh, the uh, the Indian upholstery that we use is something that has come out of two very meaningful collaborations that we have established uh, over the past year. 
Uh, one of them is with a textile maker called Zanav, based in Bangalore. Uh, Zanav is owned by Ravi Kemka, who okay. for the past 25 years has been a pioneer um, in, in terms of research and development of uh, handmade textiles in India. Yeah. Uh, so when we got, we first met Ravi about four or five years ago, but you know we weren't ready uh, to start working with him yet. So after a number of discussions and brainstorming sessions, we uh, finally decided to collaborate with him to develop a special range of textiles that was suitable for upholstery. Yeah. So we launched a collection recently uh, with Ravi, which, uh, which, which uses handmade cotton, linen, cotton linen blends, and even raw silk as a upholstery material. And, and a lot of R&D went into making them robust enough for, you know, upholstery usage. Uh, and, and that's one collection. The other collection that we launched is with a textile designer called Padmaja Krishnan, who yeah. runs her own label, fashion label based out of Mumbai. Uh, so Padmaja worked with uh, patchwork fabric. So she, from the uh, waste that that is generated by the fashion industry and specifically so it's upcycle it's upcycle it's upcycle so you know we use so each each chair that we make with Padmaja's textile is unique because it's a one-of-a-kind design made from whatever is available at that point yeah. you know yeah. and it's hand stitched and put yeah. together and you know yeah uh, so that's a very special collection but that's a new collaboration, right? That's because a new collaboration. I, I think you've just announced it. Um, tell us about all your very exciting international collaborations. I mean, there's been one with Derek Welch. There's one with the Excellent Studio. I'll let you tell me more. So, um, you know, the Chandigarh collection was what we started off with. But I was always clear that while that was our origin story, if you will, Phantom Hands was always about carrying forward that legacy and not just looking back and, you know, uh, at the past. So we were always looking out for contemporary designers that we could collaborate with. And uh, it was really important that, that our values aligned with uh, whoever we worked with. And I happened to see a chair designed by Inora Sue. They're a Japanese design duo based out of Milan. Okay. Uh, I came across a chair of theirs in Milan and immediately fell in love with it. Um, so I reached out to them and met them in Milan. This was in 2017. This is during their design, uh, their design week festival. It was not during the design, but I went specifically to meet them. And uh, we were just a small workshop at that point, And they were quite well known internationally. Uh, they already made chairs for uh, big names, big furniture makers in Japan. So, but you know, they we just immediately connected and they completely understood what we were doing and what our, uh, you know, philosophy was. And they loved the idea of designing for craft-based production because the other furniture makers they worked with uh, were, you know, used much more industrial methods of production. CNC machines and the likes, but they loved the idea of designing for the hand. So they came down to our workshop in Bangalore, spent a month with our craftsmen going back and forth and created the first contemporary collection called the Mungaru collection. Um, Mungaru is a word in Kannada, which means cool monsoon breeze. And oh, nice. they were here during the monsoon yeah. season. So yeah. That's how we ended up naming it uh, yeah. Mungaru Collection. And uh, yeah, and then subsequently they've come back a couple of times more and, and created a second collection called the Tangali Collection, where the focus was very much on innovative cane weaving patterns. So they pushed our cane weavers to do things that they had never done before. And that was quite interesting in terms of, you know, weave patterns, in terms of just, you know, uh, the way one approached uh, with the, with the weaving process and things like that. And they took this back to Japan or they sold it all over? 
No, so the way we work is they design for us and then we license the design. So we have exclusive, ex an exclusive license to produce and distribute the furniture. So we are responsible for uh, distributing and selling the furniture. But, but I love this idea of, you know, like this global cross pollination, everything is committed to crafts or made by hand. And it's still, you know, it, it feeds the world, right? Very much, very much. I think one of the challenges that craft in India faces is a lot of end products that come out of extremely high high, uh, high level of craftsmanship are not relevant to the contemporary world. And unless you marry craft with contemporary design, craft is not going to survive. You so don't that's, think that works? Uh, you think that applies today, even like in a post-internet world? Because I see, I mean, I work very closely with weavers. Um, across India, I see what they do. And sometimes I can't tell if a sari was made by, you know, a weaver or if it's Abraham and Thakur or raw mango. I think the internet has sort of flattened that design intervention a little bit. I mean, perhaps, I, I don't know if, if, it's, if it's a one size fits all kind of philosophy, but especially with furniture and, and yeah, certain other crafts, yeah. uh, you know, if you, the the form the end form the design should work well in you know modern apartments or, or yeah. contemporary settings you know it, if you make a chair if you make an extremely ornate chair with a lot of carving and whatever it yeah. you know it could work in a, in a certain kind of setting but it doesn't have the universal appeal that that a more simple minimal design will have also, maybe the functionality, right? A sari is a sari is a sari anywhere in the world, I suppose. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. So there are so many like copycats of phantom hands. I mean, I can just Google and you know, so many of these random e-commerce sites just pop up, which is so similar to your design language. Do you bother with them or do you just well, ignore them? Look, I think I think so. The Chandigarh pieces, like I said, are open source. So the, so anybody can make them. There's no restriction yeah. on, on them being made. I think. But what, what happens, what we see is people copy everything from our photography style to our to the text on our website. So you your know, website that, is fantastic. It's like a magazine. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but I think the problem we have is when people copy our contemporary designs because those are exclusively licensed to us. And those, yeah. um, a lot of people have already copied, not just in India, but we've come across copycats in France, the Netherlands. And ironically, it's much easier to, to take legal action outside India. So in Europe, we've successfully <laughs> shut down two of these copycats, but in India, it's, it's, it's a lot harder. Do it. You just have to be flattered, I guess. Yes, yes. Be flattered yes. and just love it. I mean, it honestly doesn't bother me too much, you know. <laughs> so, so. I want to ask you about your sales model, which I find, you know, a, a little slow, a little unusual. So customers either place an order on your website or they place an order with one of your retailers across the world and you have multiple sources in Hong Kong, South Korea, the Netherlands, everywhere. Tell me how your sales model works out for you. So, you know, when we actually had an e-commerce site three or four years ago and we shut that down and decided to go offline. When I say offline, customers write to us, they discover our catalog on our website, write to us. And then, uh, you know, there is a process, there is a conversation that happens. So this is something that I was very keen on. I didn't want us to become an impersonal e-commerce site because the experience of... Is everything made to order then? We Yes, we do not carry stock or we carry very little stock. Uh, when a customer places... An, so the models that we make are fixed. So we don't... We have 30-odd models that we make. But mm. yes, you know, uh, we make them when a customer places an order with us. So it's a very personal approach to sales. And why do you do that? How does that work out? I think Mostly. it's, I, well, I think it's, it's, it's really, um, well, firstly, we are not a mass producer. We never want to be a mass producer. So there's a limited, because it's craft based, there is a limited bandwidth that we have for production. And 
in some ways, I think if a customer wants to really wants to buy our products, they they perhaps go go that extra mile in terms of you know just just actually I wouldn't even say go that extra mile. I think it enhances the customer's experience too because then they're talking to us. They have you know there's so much of back and forth. There's feedback on you know what kind of finish they want. There are things that we can customize. Like, you know, for example, we inscribe personalized messages on some of our chairs if our customers want them. All of this can't happen over an e-commerce website, you know. Yeah. So it's a very personalized sales experience. And, and that is really important to us as a brand. And that is part of our brand ethos, you know. And it's also collaborative, right? It's, it's very not collaborative. just buying something off a shelf or buying something off a website. It's, it's very collaborative. And, then, and if you order a piece of a chair from us, you know, if a customer wants to know who made it, and then, you know, there is, we can, you know, we, we've had customers who even asked us for photographs of the carpenter who's made their chair, or, you know, sometimes they want a signed note from the carpenter. So we can do all of this, you know, how would you do that on an e-commerce site? You know? So it is an emotional purchase as yeah, well. Very much. And, and when you buy a Phantom Hands product, and I always say this, you're not just buying a piece of furniture. It's, it's yeah. so much more. Yeah. And I think that's how companies are moving, you know, they're becoming yeah. smaller, more intimate, more collaborative, yeah. where every where every hand that has sort of touched the product is sort of acknowledged, right? Very much, very much. And uh, similarly, the dealers that we work with, we're very careful about um, selecting our retail partners. Mm -hmm. You know, we spend a lot of time, much like the process of uh finding designers to work with the yeah. retailers that so we we say no to yeah. an, you know so many retailers who approach us from around the world who promise us like you know whatever 100 pieces a month or whatever. i mean we just we don't go by of course numbers are important profitability is important you know you need to sustain the business but that is not the only criteria we, we work with dealers and retail partners who understand our philosophy are happy I, they usually boutique um boutique shops who so deepak how do you find the balance between a sustainable business model and something that uh puts such great value on craft i think I, it hasn't been too difficult to be honest i think because um while you know i, I think i think somewhere the fact that i i come with a solid business training and i i come from the world of finance and while the philosophy is very clear, I also have a very strong sense of operations and costs and how we manage our backing. So, uh, you know, plus the systems and processes that we have in place, you know, we're very high tech for a, for a furniture, for a craft based furniture making company, we're incredibly high tech in our backing. Like how? So, Give me an example. So I have, so on my phone, I have data about everything that's happening in the company not just financial data that of course is but production data so we have yeah. i can be sitting anywhere in the world and every component i know on a, on, a, on an hourly basis what's being made how much wood is being consumed which material is being consumed so i can track anything on my phone and so those are the have like an in-house app like every, every we use we use a few applications from different vendors but we have you know so so to create a business to be able to do what we do it's not enough to to uh, to just make fantastic yeah. products you, there's yeah. there's a whole system working behind it and then yeah. that's where my experience i don't come from a design background i don't come from a, a, a manufacturing background i don't come from a craft background i got into this i was nearly 40 when i started phantom hands so but all the other training that i've had has has sort of come to the fore here and that's that's what makes it a you know a business that works. Fair enough. Fair mm. enough. Um, you know, a lot of home companies like Jaipur Rugs, a, a lot of deco companies, have really done well during the last two years because of COVID, because of everyone being at home and focusing on their home interiors. Will you tell me how it's worked out for, for Phantom Hands? You know, we've had the same experience too. Of course, uh, 2020, when when the, when the first COVID lockdown happened, was a really bad period for us because you know nobody knew what was going on, and uh, we shut down the workshop completely for a couple of months. Uh, but after that, we've 
we've we've seen an increase in sales in especially i think the indian market has has grown for us uh, over the last i think our india sales has doubled over the last 12 months um clearly i think some part of it has got to do with the fact that people are spending more time at home or you know very much more conscious about the kind of objects they want in their home um and and that has helped us too i think the asia in general has been a huge revelation for us in the last two years we've actually seen a bit of a decline in sales in europe but mm. india taiwan even china japan they've more than made up for it singapore so you know i'm very bullish on asia so. i want to ask you how is it possible for a company to maintain its profitability as well as to ensure that the the artisan or the maker of the craft is benefited substantially what is your theory on this i think you know very honestly i think because uh, we are able to do it because the, the value of our product the intrinsic value of our product um captures in a way the what it takes to um compensate your artisans compensate your entire ecosystem so our you know our products are not necessarily the cheapest there is a certain we are at a certain price point because we need to be able to do all of this to the artisan so so again going back to your question when you buy a phantom hands product it's not just the value of the wood or the actual value of the material that's gone into it you're actually in some ways being responsible for the entire ecosystem so the you know and isn't there always a, a danger of taking more and giving less perhaps i don't know i don't know how to answer this question but but i know that um we take it very seriously we uh very often i mean there are a lot of things that actually these are perhaps not even special things but just hygiene factors that everyone i believe should do things should like follow. should follow i mean just to give you an example every every employee every craftsman in phantom hands um it has has complete health insurance coverage for themselves and their families um obviously they're all on you know pf and pension they have all those benefits um our average craftsman probably get paid more than an average software engineer in bangalore so so we are not serious yeah i mean and, and the, but why should that even be surprising why do they not deserve it because it's a rarity yeah um but i you know but it should i think we should get to a point where this is not even a surprise it's 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 you know why don't they deserve it and that's the reason why we're losing our craft so my best crafts uh artisans don't want their children to get into this profession they want their children to you know become engineers or whatever and the irony is that they will probably make you know less money in that profession than they will working for a company like phantom hands but you know maybe then maybe uh there are very few companies like us who who actually you know take care of pay those level of wages so i don't know but it's it's well, i'm yeah. i'm very happy to hear this more power to you more power to phantom hands and all the other hands you support thank you namrata it's been wonderful chatting deepa thank you for making the time thank you so much if you enjoyed the show or not write to me on instagram twitter or clubhouse at namrata sitar for updates on tell me how you did it follow us at hd smartcast We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse. To listen to more podcasts, log on to hdsmartcast. dot com or suno nae nazariye se.